again my thanks for your time. Um, obviously the police minister needs no introduction. Um, this morning uh, we have released the annual police statistical review which is the uh, crime and related figures for the uh, last statistical year which is the same as the financial year in other words 2010-2011. Uh, later today in Parliament, the Minister will be tabling the companion document, that's the Police Annual Report for the same period, uh, but for now uh, this is in respect of the statistical review. Um, I'll hand over to the Minister, uh, but um, we appreciate you've only just got the document, uh, and I'm happy to come back early tomorrow morning or next week, and we're also happy to follow up uh, with any questions or queries you may have. So, uh, Minister, thank you for your time today. Okay. Uh, th thanks, Commissioner, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, as the Commissioner has indicated, uh, the statistical review um, will, it is now tabled um, and uh, is available for public uh, scrutiny. Uh, and the annual report, uh, I am required to table that in the Parliament, so that will be made available uh, later on today. Um, so, once again, for the 10th consecutive year, we've seen a reduction in the overall crime rates in Queensland of around 3 per cent. And in terms of a year on, uh, in terms of an 11 year uh, trend, which is from 2000 and 2001 to the current year, uh, that uh, results in a 30 per cent reduction in the overall rate of crime. And just to explain, the overall rate includes all categories of crime uh, in together, and those figures show a real reduction. In terms of the particular uh, major categories, um, offences against the person, uh, which is predominantly made up with uh, assaults, uh, down 6% year on year, uh, and since 2000-2001, a 25% reduction in the rate. Property offences are up this year by 4%. However, since 2000-2001, uh, an overall reduction in the rate of property crime of 46%. As with previous years, um, when you analyse the statistics, statistics through the uh, published document, you will see volatility uh, both in region to region, um, district to district uh, and category of crime. Uh, there's nothing unusual in that and that's why uh, I think it's important that whereas we do look at the individual uh, rates of increases and de decreases year on year, uh, it is the overall trends over time which are important and as I've indicated, um, very clearly, and you can see those through the graphs uh, which are behind you, in all of the significant categories, offences against the person and property crime, over that 11-year period from 2000 to 2001, uh, there has been a significant reduction in the rate of crime. Uh, when you look at the trends um, over years even before that, uh, in these major categories, offences against the person, predominantly assaults and property offences, basically peaked around 2000-2001. Uh, and since that period of time, we've seen that steady decline, which, which I've indicated. And I just again want to uh, pay tribute to the professionalism and dedication of the Queensland Police Service officers uh, for achieving those results. Uh, this is a combination <coughs> of a number of factors. Uh, coincidentally, uh, uh, around that time, uh, the Commissioner, uh, on his appointment, introduced operational performance reviews, uh, which focuses at the regional and district level uh, and right down to the divisional level, it focuses officers' attention on particular crime trends in their area of responsibility. And those operational performance reviews, in my view, have had a significant, uh, have been a significant contributor uh, to reducing the crime rate. Similarly, over that period, uh, and indeed before, uh, since the government was elected, we've seen a significant increase uh, in the number of police resources. Uh, if you go back to 1998, uh, the police to population ratio was around one officer for every 507 residents of Queensland. Uh, that's now been significantly reduced down to one officer to every 436. So over that period of time, we've seen an increase uh, in the number of police officers on the beat uh, and a reduction in crime rates. Uh, the other issue um, which is, uh, is important is clearance rates. Clearance rates have in fact reduced a little this year, uh, but when you, again, when you again look over time, uh, clearance rates for the major categories of crime uh, have increased. Uh, for example, um, offences against the person, again predominantly uh, assault rates is the major component of that. 2000-2001, uh, 63 per cent uh, cleared, 2010-11 uh, up to 73 per cent. Uh, property offences around 2000-2001, a clearance rate uh, of 23 per cent, uh, this financial year 30 per cent, uh, even though it has decreased slightly over last year. So again, uh, the clear uh, indicators, uh, in my view, 
um, uh, crime rates have been coming down, clearance rates have been going up over that period of time. I just might mention a couple of areas of interest. Um, the southeast region, which includes the Gold Coast, of course, we've had a significant uh, public interest in some of the horrific um, crimes, particularly uh, the loss of um, Damien Leading uh, and other um, significant offences uh, early this year. Um, on the Gold Coast, uh, in, well, in the southeast region, we have seen an increase uh, in some categories of offences, uh, break and enters, for example. Uh, but by the same token, as I've indicated, you will see volatility right across um, regions, uh, districts and categories of crime. Uh, we did see decreases in the overall rate of assaults uh, of around 9%. Um, armed robberies, or the rate of armed robberies in the southeast region, basically remained the same as the year before. Uh, and overall, uh, the rate of armed robberies on the Gold Coast in the 11 years from 2000, 2001 uh, to the present declined by 26%. Uh, the other area of interest uh, which uh, created some interest last year was that in the uh, issue of youth crime, uh, particularly uh, young offenders uh, in the 15 to 19 year old male group, uh, which uh, has for a considerable period of time made up the largest proportion of offenders. Uh, year on year for this year for offences against the person, again these are offences predominantly made up of assaults, uh, there's been an 11% reduction in the number of offenders in that age group category. And for unlawful entry, again, uh, predominantly break and enters, uh, there's been an 8.7% reduction in the number of offenders, and it's, uh, there's some, that's reflected in uh, some other categories as well. So uh, the key points here, in my view, um, a continued uh, trend of reducing crime rates in Queensland. Um, important to recognise that there will be volatility, uh, increases and decreases year on year between districts, um, regions, and between crime categories, but the clear trends um, since 2000-2001 has been a steady and significant decline uh, in the, uh, the rates of uh, crime in Queensland. Um, and in basically all of those significant categories, uh, the trends are positive. Um, I might um, uh, hand over to the Commissioner. As the Commissioner indicated earlier, we understand that you've only just uh, received these documents, uh, and obviously uh, there will be opportunities to um, take further questions over the next couple of days. Thanks. Thanks very much, Minister. And uh, can I um, acknowledge the additional police that we've had uh, over the last 10 years particularly, because certainly that's been a major factor in, um, in, in achieving the results that have been attained in the last 10 years. I want to come back to that later, but as to other reasons. But uh, just to summarise again the, the results for this last statistical uh, year, which of course is the same as the financial year, um, we're pleased with the further decrease in the rate of offences against the person, as the Minister indicated. That's everything to do with people's safety, starting with the most serious offence of murder and then going down to minor assault and everything in between. It includes armed robbery offences as well. So it's good to see that come down yet again. Um, we're disappointed in the increase uh, in terms of property crime. Um, it's a 4% increase. In the main, that's um, petty theft, um, stealing from vehicles, uh, that's the, where the bulk of that increase has come from. Uh, breaking and entering offences have um, tended to come down slightly, which is a good thing, but any increase is disappointing, so we'll work uh, hard. Uh, there's a bit of a trend already this year for um, that increase to continue, so we'll work hard to try and stabilise that, or if we can, bring that down further. I wish, as your Commissioner, that I could say to you, um, every year we will reduce crime. Um, I'd like to be able to say that to you, but you and I both know that that's not viable because what that would mean, as much as it would be a utopian objective, is that one day there would be no crime. Uh, because if every year we reduce crime, we'd get to a point at some stage in the future where, where crime would cease to exist. So, um, uh, but please don't think that we're taking our foot off the accelerator or uh, uh, not making the effort we are. Uh, and the 11% increase in the rate of other offences, uh, and that. Other offences are those offences that are exclusively uh, generated by the police. No one actually makes a complaint. These are things uh, like public order offences, uh, people behaving badly in licensed premises, those sorts of things that are detected by the police and they take action. Uh, I think there's probably two reasons for that reduction, and it's a pretty consistent reduction across the state. Uh, every region had a reduction in this area. I think uh, the primary reason has probably been that that for a very large part of that last year, 
uh, the police service with many other agencies of course was totally focused on the effects of the floods and cyclones and the terrible events in Toowoomba and the Lockyer Valley. Um, that, that really uh, was a, a massive effort for everyone. Uh, it's possible as well that that reduction reflects uh, improved behaviour by some people in terms of alcohol related behaviour. I certainly think the drink safe precinct trials in Townsville the valley and surface paradise have been uh, really good and have seen uh, some better outcomes and results. So can't tell you definitively, but I um, definitely the fact that we were involved in the floods and cyclones has contributed because we had less police out there and about because they were so focused on those things. And hopefully it's all also an indicator of better public behaviour. Um, this is quite a significant document and uh, I'm grateful to, to the people who put it together. We've added a few bits to it this year. There's uh, a section in there on missing persons, uh, which you may find of interest. Uh, and what that shows is the vast majority of missing persons are located each year, which is a good thing. And there's some additional material on traffic. There's also some useful graphs because we can talk about numbers and figures and, and what well, I find it interesting, um, always because it's our bread and butter, but uh, what is interesting is the graphs though, and there's a whole series of graphs starting from page 18 uh, over the 12 month period that show, but more interesting I think and relevant is the series of graphs starting on page 36 that go onwards and show a trend over 30 years. Um, and starting with the first one, which is homicide. And, you know, if we asked many people and said, are you at greater or more risk, uh, sorry, greater or lesser risk today of being the victim of murder or homicide than you would have been 30 years ago, most people would probably say more risk. But the reality is when we look at that, we just see how that's come down over time in the last 30 years. So the reality is that for the average Queensland citizen today, uh, they're at less risk of being the victim of a murder than they would have been 30 years ago. Uh, another interesting one is robbery, uh, and you can see, as the Minister said, where a lot of crime uh, peaked around about the year 99-2000, and uh, robbery offences have come down uh, since then. Regrettably, that statewide trend, as the Minister indicated, has not been reflected in the Gold Coast, uh, or for that matter the South East region, which takes in the Gold Coast District, Coomera District, a new district only established in 2009, and Logan District. And what's tended to happen there is um, that whilst robbery offences have not gone up in the 10-year period, neither have they come down to the extent that obviously would have, we, we would have liked that's matched the rest of the state. And if I could give you some examples of that, uh, for armed robbery offences in the Gold Coast District, 10 years ago in 2001-2002, there were 151 armed robbery offences in the Gold Coast District. Uh, that went down to as low as 84 a couple of years later, from 151 down to 84, but then it bounced back up again. And three years ago it was 146, so 151 on the Gold Coast District 10 years ago, three years ago 146, um, last year 105, and in the year just concluded that we're talking about now 119. So regrettably what hasn't happened there is we haven't seen the same statewide trend. So that's, that's a goal for us to try and uh, bring those offences in the Gold Coast uh, down. But they certainly um, have not exploded and have, have not gone up. Um, the final comment I just wanted to make before we open it to questions is that um, to express my appreciation obviously to the people in the Queensland Police Service who've provided the results they have in the last 10 years but also to some other areas as well and I acknowledge the support of the government with the increased police numbers. Um, our approach has been a three-part approach. Uh, it's been reactive policing, so in other words if a crime happens to respond to it to try and solve it and, and catch the offenders. Um, what we've always tried to do is reduce crime and increase clear-up rates. That's the overall goal. Uh, the second response has been to try and prevent things from happening. Uh, it's far better to prevent crime than solve it and to have it happen. And the third is to work with other agencies in terms of what we call causal factor problem solving. In other words, what's the underlying causal factors to crime uh, in, in the different communities throughout Queensland and how can we deal with those. Uh, and, and with that, I would just want to acknowledge while you're here the support of the media. We can only be effective if the public are kept informed of what's going on. I think it's a really important balance to do that without you know, causing people unnecessary alarm, but to keep them well informed. And I think the partnership we have in Queensland between the police, 
the community and the media. There's actually been a pretty good partnership in the last 10 years, so I thank you for your contribution in that space as well. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions you have about this or, for that matter, uh, any other issue. Thank you. If armed robberies have remained the same, what's pushed crime up in the southern region? Uh, what's southeast region, sorry. Yeah, the southeast region. Property crime's up. Um, but overall, um, what we call crimes against the person, that's uh, all of those things that relate to safety, that's down, and that's been consistently down, uh, which is a great result. In the southeastern region, it seems like armed robbery is you know, largely the same, but is there a, was there a variation within the financial year um, where there were more armed robberies in the start of this? Yes, and that'll happen. That, that's a good question. That'll happen because, as you'll see from those charts in there over a whole year, um, if there's um, if there's uh, 120 armed robbery offences somewhere in a, in one, any of our 31 districts over 12 months, there won't be 10 every month. Uh, it'll be up and down, up and down. It, it, broadly speaking, uh, we tend to get more crime in the hotter months you know, than we do in winter. Uh, I guess that just makes obvious sense, doesn't it? People are out and about, you know, it's not cold and they're not home, and it's not cold, wet and raining. Um, but we did have a dreadful spike and in increase in armed robbery offences in the South East region, the Gold Coast, um, in that period uh, of around about May this year. Um, for a couple of months and of course that um, ultimately was the same time frame in terms of the uh, tragedy of the uh, the death of uh, Damien Leading, Detective Senior Constable Damien Leading. Um, so that was the spike in that period around about um, uh, April, May, June. Has it No, it hasn't. That's stabilised. Yeah. Statistics on the weapons used in armed robbery, like are more guns being used or knives being used on the Gold Coast in particular? Yeah, yeah. I can come back to you, sir, you know, with the precise detail of that, um, but ballpark figures in that space are that um, around about 15 to 20 per cent of weapons used in armed robberies are firearms, and it's slightly higher for the southeast region than the rest of the state. So if the rest of the state averages out at around about 15 to 18 per cent, say, for firearms, the Gold Coast is around 20 per cent. But it's not a massive difference, but slightly higher for weapons in the Gold Coast. Um, and the, 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 the other weapons, obviously, are knives um, and um, machetes and things like that, you know, and in some cases, bottles and things, in some cases, syringes too. Was there a spike in property-related crime around the January floods? Uh, look, I don't think so. That seems to have evened out. And, in fact, one of the things we were heartened by uh, was the actual lack of opportunistic crime and looting uh, that did occur uh, in that period. I mean, there was some. Uh, but really it was quite minimal, so no, we don't think so. So the spike that occurred in total offences in January, do you not attribute any of that to the impact of the floods? I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't think we said there was a spike in January. I'm just looking at the charts at the back of the room, there's a spike in January. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. questioning whether you attribute any of that to the, the impact of the floods. Look, look, um, it, it, it could have been. Um, I actually don't have the, defi the precise answer to that. What, what we don't believe happened was that there was excessive looting. There was some looting, but it, we don't believe it was excessive. Um, and, of course, um, um, generally speaking, every year there will be an increase in crime uh, around about the summer months, December, January. That's not unusual. Uh, and I'm not laying the blame here, but sometimes that's because there are children who aren't at school and they're, they're unoccupied, but as the Minister indicated, juvenile crime is not increasing across the board. Uh, but it is a trend for many, many years and will probably continue into the future that we get more crime in the more warmer months than we do in the middle of winter. So do you not think perhaps people may have become more desperate you know, when they were confronted by such difficult circumstances and it may have turned to crime? Yeah, again, that's a really good question and it comes down to uh, the, the economic situation. There are different views about that. Um, there is a view that unemployment um, and loss of income will turn people to crime. Uh, there are other views as well that the, the, the claim in that regard is overstated. Um, it's a hard one for me as your police commissioner to be able to give you a definitive answer on. I think personally, for what it's worth, I think that um, unemployment and poverty, yes, it does lead to crime. Um, but uh, there are other factors as well and it's certainly not the sole reason. The figures show that you need to change your structure of policing, maybe more police in certain areas where there's more prevalent crime. Yeah. Um, that, again, thanks for that question. Uh, what we try to do in Queensland, we have a unique situation in Queensland. We're one of the largest police departments in the uh, English-speaking Western world. 
Um, if we were in America, for example, where there are 17 to 18,000 police departments, we'd be in the top five in terms of the size of the department. But the uniqueness we have is we're so decentralised. Um, so we're not a small state, we're a geographically large state, and we have cities like Cairns, you know, that are further from Brisbane than Melbourne is. So we have to provide a policing service to the whole of the state and, and a comprehensive policing service. So at Cairns, for example, uh, we have to have a dog squad, uh, we have to have a forensic unit, we even have a cert unit. Um, we have to have all of the things that you'd have in Melbourne, you know, um, for Victoria, based in just one place. So what, what we have done in relation to that is have two fairly large commands here in Brisbane, State Crime Operations Command and Operations Support Command, uh, where we can send. So in State Crime Operations Command, if they get a murder in Cairns or they get three or four murders in the space of a month, we can send up a team of detectives from the Homicide Squad to stay there and help them out and assist. And we found that that w works really well. Uh, for example, um, in Operations Support Command, we have 50 officers in the Public Safety Response Team. They can go anywhere in Queensland at short notice uh, to help out. They also have a program schedule of activity. So I think the best model in Queensland is to have sufficient police everywhere, uh, backed up here in Brisbane by a unit that can go and support them at their time of need. If I can give you an example of that, in schoolies I think we had 377 extra police from outside the South East region that went to help them with schoolies and about 150 from outside the region that went to help them as they managed with the V8 supercar race. Uh, that's the way we think is the only way to operate in Queensland. There seems to be a problem with rapes. Last year it was down reported rates were down 8% this year. They appear to be slightly up. Do you know why that would be? That does fluctuate, and, and it can fluctuate significantly. There can be a whole range of reasons there. Uh, it's a terrible offence. Um, the, the definition of rape in some years ago was broadened, so it's a much broader definition. So more acts that previously would have been a sexual assault are now a rape offence. Um, and uh, there is no good news with this, but it's really important to point out that the vast majority of offences in this category occur between people uh, who are known to each other. Um, so um, whilst it does happen, um, it's, it's not the norm um, that um, people are walking through a park you know, and they're abducted and dragged into the bushes and raped by someone completely unknown. I'm not saying that can't and doesn't happen, uh, but fortunately in our society that sort of thing is rare. So in the vast majority of these offences of a sexual nature, including rape, sadly, because often it's an abuse of trust, uh, the victim and offender are known to each other. Um, what are the stats showing on offences against children? Offences against children? Yeah, that's fairly stable. Um, and again, of course, obviously, um, with that, uh, again, the vast majority of those situations are a breach of trust uh, by people um, uh, who are known to the child. Just looking here with the kidnapping and abduction, I gather that might actually relate to the children as well. Almost doubled in Metro North in that category. Do we know, is that mainly children or you know, do we know any contributing factor there? Yeah, you're right, generally it is. Um, and generally and, and it relates to, uh, not always, uh, but generally it relates to uh, custodial type issues and that sort of thing, yes. Um, and the figures, uh, I, I don't think... I think, again, those figures, fortunately and numerically, are not, you know, massive, um, but obviously they're of concern. And, of course, th th these things um, generally run uh, where people um, are emotionally disturbed and at very high levels, and at their worst, of course, we can have the tragedies that we've seen of murder-suicide in, in those situations. So, obviously, we take all of those very seriously, and right at the outset we take it very seriously, as well as trying to find those people as quickly as possible, uh, particularly where a child may have been abducted, you know, from a school or something like that. There seems to be a, have been a lot of attempted abductions around schools as well, and, and mm -hmm. it's almost every second week we have an alert out. Is that something that you're seeing a trend increase? Uh, look, I'd have to come back to you, um, you know, on, precisely on that. Um, certainly, um, that's of great concern. I, I, I would think for every parent, it's their worst nightmare, the thought that their child might be abducted. Something we take absolutely seriously, and I want to assure you uh, that we take every one of those complaints as genuine and absolutely seriously, and we thoroughly and exhaustively investigate every one of them, and so we should, and so we should. Um, and... Um, it, it, it is our area of, uh, well, one of our areas of absolute greatest concern. 
um, and we are very grateful as well to the support of the public um, in terms, and can I ask that you convey this message to the community, if you see anyone acting suspiciously, uh, particularly before or after school, get their number and let us know or call Crime Stoppers uh, and let us know about that. We, it, it, it's, you know, I don't think it's an invasion of anyone's privacy uh, and, and it's not being snoopy. Um, we would dearly like to know about that uh, because sometimes just that one piece of information can be incredibly uh, helpful in that situation. Now, in relation to Cairns, there's been two murders within just a few days and uh, I believe that waiting times for routine jobs were up to eight hours on the weekend. Do you believe that resources are stretched there? Uh, I wasn't aware of that claim. Um, and certainly, and as we all know, any offence uh, is only established once it's ultimately proven in the courts and anyone charged is the alleged offender and the matter has to be proven. Uh, certainly, uh, again, um, if you look at the, uh, the murder rate, as I indicated, uh, in the last 30 years it's actually come down, which has been a good thing. Uh, and might I say, I think one of the reasons for that is our greater awareness across the board as a community about domestic violence and the potential you know, risks associated with domestic violence. Uh, in my view, there's um, a good number of police in Cairns, an adequate level of staffing there. Uh, I think if you go back over the last 10 years, you'd find that we've increased uh, the number of police in that area every year. Um, and um, uh, I'm not saying that they probably couldn't use more police. I'm sure they could. Um, and um, probably next year when we get our increased numbers, there'll be more police again in Cairns. Uh, but, but I think they provide a good level of service to the community in Cairns with the officers they have. Are rates in that region are stable, are relatively stable, or are decreasing like they are across um, the There's been a slight increase in Cairns um, in property crime, which is a consistent trend across the state, yeah, but it's not a huge increase at this point in time. Against the person. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, can I just come back to that? And, and one of the things with that is when we talk about Cairns, we talk about Cairns as in the Cairns district, which stretches from just south of Cairns at Gordon Vale right through to the Torres Strait and all of the Cape. So we're talking about a very large uh, area there as well. I'm sorry. So um, on, on that area, the offences against the person, the homicide, um, serious assaults, they do seem to be much higher than the state average in the far northern region. Is that due to the Cape? Is that still the problem? Yes, yeah, sadly, uh, and again, Humphrey might say it, that's a really good point. Um, we, we've got eight regions, and, and one has to have the highest rate, the rate of, of offending uh, in terms of offences against the person. One has to have the lowest. Um, and every year, traditionally, the region with the highest rate of offences against the person, that's the number of offences per 100,000 of population, so it's not the actual number, it's the number per 100,000, that's the rate, is the far northern region. Tragically and sadly, uh, that is in part due uh, to the um, issues associated across the Cape and in many cases in the smaller communities in the Cape. Uh, and that's something we're mindful of and we're working uh, with those communities uh, in terms of trying to uh, address that. Uh, I can't speak for the government, I'm not a politician, but the alcohol management plans have been introduced and I think they've been a good thing. Uh, and for our part, um, we're, um, uh, we've increased numbers uh, in the smaller communities uh, and uh, in some cases we've um, managed to put into place police citizens youth clubs which we think have been a good thing as well. I'm sorry? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm a supporter of the AMP. I, I recognise the difficulty with that uh, and the angst uh, from some people in the communities um, but I, I am a supporter and it's my own view that they have helped um, reduce violence. One of the more concerning um, stats is an increase of around 20% in computer fraud. Is that surprising? No, not at all. And uh, I think that's a trend. And I think, um, you know, um, uh, it's reflective of um, the society and world in which we live in today. And, and, and our people in the fraud squad uh, often plead. Um, there are many aspects to computer fraud, but one, sadly, um, is the one where people are taken advantage of. Um, and, and that tends to move across three areas or be across three areas. The first is those people who contact you and say that, you know, your great uncle's died and you've inherited a fortune. Um, and the second is that you've won some lottery prize. And sadly the third, which is even more cruel, is romance fraud, uh, where someone will pose, say, to be a retired aircraft pilot uh, who's a bit lonely and looking for some company and, 
and that leads to, well, I'd love to come and visit you in Australia, but could you send me the, the airfares because I'm in a little bit of financial difficulty and, and people who, you know, are taken in by that. Um, so, again, we really depend on the media's help in constantly getting those messages out. If it sounds too good to be true, it is, uh, and don't be sucked in by it. Yeah. I think, can I just add to um, um, internet fraud in particular, it's probably one of the most unreported crimes um, around, and we really do encourage members of the community, however small uh, an offence it might appear to be to them, to report to their local police station, because I think uh, both nationally and internationally, uh, many people simply don't report uh, attempts at uh, internet-based fraud. So uh, the more people that report, uh, these figures will continue to rise year on year, uh, but we need to get a, a better picture so we can start to target those offenders. And as you'd be aware, uh, Queensland Police Service, through, uh, through uh, Superintendent, I think he's Brian Hay, Brian Hay uh, just getting his um, uh, rank correct. So, um, Superintendent Brian Hay um, recognised internationally for his work, but it is something we really do need the community to, um, you know, report uh, because there is an underreporting of that uh, that crime. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, the offences committed against police officers in the state? Yeah, that's obviously concerning and disturbing. Um, there's been an increase in the Gold Coast district in terms of the uh, level of assaults on police. Uh, I need to drill down and look more closely at that. Uh, please don't think this is uh, in any sense spin or gloss or trying to put a positive light on that, but it could be that part of that has been the increased level of activity because the more police you have and the more active they are, the more they'll be arresting drunks and people acting offensively and the more likelihood of being assaulted. Uh, but there's been an increase in the Gold Coast District. But there is some good news in that space, and that is that the rate, which is the important figure for this, across the state has actually come down a little bit. Um, and the rate at the moment, I think, is about 220, 221. So for every 1,000 police in Queensland each year, in the last year, about 220 will be assaulted each year. That varies across the state. Um, the worst region is the northern region, which takes in Townsville and Mount Isa, where the rate is uh, up around 390. So 390 of every 1,000 police in that region get assaulted each year at the moment. The best region is Metro South, that's the south side of Brisbane, where the rate is about 190, uh, and it averages out at about 220. That's still nearly a quarter of the workforce, and it's still too high, and we still need to do more about that. Are the rates proportional um, between uh, the increase in uh, offences committed against police officers at the Gold Coast to the, the amount of officers that are being put on the beats? Yeah, yeah, entirely. Uh, pretty much, yeah, you're right. Um, and that's why the rate is so important. There's about 1,500 police uh, in the southeast region, where in other regions there's about 600 police. So you can't measure this on the basis of saying, you know, in one region so many police get assaulted and in another... It depends on the number of police, obviously. Uh, so the rate is the important figure, and the rate is the number of assaults on police per 1,000 police officers. And as I mentioned, that currently averaging out about 220, which is a reduction on last year. So it's come down a bit, which is a good trend, and we hope we can continue that. But again, that's nearly a quarter of the workforce. Uh, and, you know, I mean, that is far too many. I mean, if, if a quarter of the teachers in Queensland were assaulted each year, that probably they'd be pretty upset. And I know policing is a difficult and dangerous job, but I still think, you know, that's too many, and we need to keep working at trying to reduce that. Do these figures have any bearing on the police chopper trial? Uh, I think too early. Yeah, that's only been going for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Has there been an election without one or there be a big um, policy change in that area? Um, do you have any views on sort of mandatory sentencing? No, I've never got into that space. That's a matter for the government. What I've always said is that I believe, obviously, that... And the other thing is that I've got enough to do with running, you know, the police department uh, without getting into telling judges and magistrates how they should operate. And obviously I'm grateful if they not to try and tell me how to run the police department, I suppose, too. Um, but um, but um, uh, it's a matter for the government because it relates to government policy and it's really a question for the minister. All I would ask uh, is that we're in this space of... Um, of, of assaults on police, um, that, that these sentences um, also have a deterrent effect where that's appropriate, and, and that's taken into consideration. Yeah. And I'm happy to respond to that question. The government is opposed to mandatory uh, sentencing. Um, I've looked at this issue. There have been calls uh, for mandatory penalties or sentencings for 
assaults on police and indeed a whole range of other um, assault type offences. Uh, the evidence, in my view, uh, is that it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't send a deterrent. There may be some short-term impact, but over time, uh, the evidence uh, both nationally and internationally that I've looked at shows that uh, whether it be assaults or any other opportunistic crime, uh, the fact that uh, you're going to expect people to think there's going to be a mandatory sentence will deter them from actually committing that crime. The evidence doesn't stack up. Uh, we uh, strongly believe that uh, it's in the, the purview of the court to make those decisions. Um, some years ago, we increased the uh, penalties for assaults on police and indeed other public officials, whether it be ambulance officers, fire and rescue officers and others, uh, to uh, enable that to be a maximum penalty of eight years, uh, whereas previously many of those assaults uh, would have been considered uh, three-year offences. Uh, the Court of Appeal, through uh, Chief Justice uh, Paul de Jersey, has made it perfectly clear in judgments that, um, that, and this is strong guidance to the courts, that he expects or would expect that a person who spits on or throws bodily fluids or, or blood, etc., out of police officer can expect to get a jail sentence. And when you look at um, the actual sentences which are being imposed, yes, you will find some where custodial sentences have not been imposed, but there are many, many others where it is. Um, so from the government's point of view, we do not support uh, mandatory sentencing for these types of offences. Of course, uh, any assault on a police officer or an ambulance officer or a fire and rescue officer is absolutely unacceptable, uh, but the courts have got the, the power that they need to uh, meet out an appropriate penalty. Do you think that the penalty for assaults on police should be increased? Penalty for? for assault of police officers. No, no, I, I think the penalty is adequate. I think each case uh, needs to be treated on its own individual circumstances. Um, but, but obviously, um, uh, it's an important issue for me. Uh, and where appropriate, um, I, I think I believe that um, you know it should be a deterrent. Uh, but that's a matter for the presiding judge uh, or magistrate, you know, in respect to the circumstances of each particular case. The other point I just make is that. Um, uh, the, the rate of assault on the police, of course, is of concern. I mean, 220 officers per thousand as the average rate is, is just appalling. Um, but uh, the positive thing, and uh, we can produce these figures um, later if you wish, is the trends of assaults on police have been decreasing um, over, the, over recent years. And I can give you the five-year figures. Last year it was 241 per thousand. It's dropped into 220. Uh, five years ago it was much, much higher. So. Uh, whereas any level of assault is absolutely unacceptable, the trends, thankfully, are, are trending downwards. Commissioner, can you say with confidence that the job cuts you're having to uh, go through at the moment to keep your budget in line for, for the government is not going to impact crime rates this time next year when we're sitting here? Well, I would hope it wouldn't. Um, obviously, that's such a, with respect, such a broad-ranging question that you couldn't give a definitive answer. What I've said, and I'm happy to repeat, is that um, what we've done, in fact, we had a meeting between 7 and 8 this morning just to further progress how we're going to manage that. And what we've done is try and minimise absolutely the impact on operational police, um, but we can't sort of guarantee that we'll be able to do that entirely. So we've looked across the state at all of our areas, and for our eight regions and those two support commands here at headquarters that I talked about before, uh, the reduction in civilian staff member numbers through the voluntary separation program um, and, if need be, natural attrition will be around about 3 to 4 per cent for those operational areas in headquarters as quite in headquarters um, for all the areas except for those two operationally based type support commands, State Crime Operations Command and Operations Support Command, the cut will be about 10 to 12 per cent. So we're trying to take the reductions out of the administrative type larger support areas like um, HR, ICT, administration, those areas. Um, uh, we will endeavour at all costs to minimise the impact on, on operational police. There is no reduction in police numbers and in fact uh, the government have given a commitment to me that police numbers will continue to increase. Um, but uh, in some areas obviously if an administration support person uh, is, 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 um, takes a voluntary separation program then it might be that the, some of the police there have to do some of the work that might have been done by the administration officer. I can't give you an unequivocal unequivocal guarantee that that won't happen in some cases. What I am saying is that we're trying to minimise that. The other important point is we're not going to lose any civilian staff members in what we call one-on-one -on -one roles in terms of replacing a police officer. So, for example, 
we have a number of people who answer the radio uh, and work in police radio communication rooms throughout the state, whereas once that was all police, now it's a mix of police and civilians. In the main, civilians. They do a great job. There won't be any reductions there. We have a number of um, watch house officers now um, who are civilians in, in, in a police uniform uh, who work and assist police in watch houses. There'll be no reduction there either. So in terms of what we call the one-on-ones, where a person comes in and frees up a police officer to go out on the street, no reduction there. So you say unequivocally that it won't take officers off the street? Uh, no, what I thought I just said was unequivocally that uh, we're not reducing police uh, and um, we're not taking, we're not replacing civilian staff members who do a one-on-one -on -one role. In other words, that their job, if they weren't there, would have to be done and would have to be done by a police officer. We're, we're sustaining these losses f through people who generally work in administrative support roles. If I didn't make myself clear, I'm sorry. What I'm saying is that though in a, in a, in a station or a district, if you take out someone who's in an administration and support role, um, it may be that, that some of that work you know, might have to be done uh, by a police officer where the police officer had someone else doing it in terms of the paperwork. But we're trying to minimise that, OK? And, and certainly we're absolutely um, you know, trying to minimise totally uh, any operational impact for the public. Yeah. An example of that is the armed robbery squad, the one on the Gold Coast. I think their administration officer is the same. So that would be an example of somebody that might be replaced. I understand that theirs is outgoing, the administration officer for the new armed robbery squad. Yeah, I'm sorry, which squad was that? Well, they haven't got an admin officer yet. They've got, uh, I don't think, they've got 18 people, 18 detectives. We increased that to 20. We put two intel officers there. Uh, I actually don't think we've actually assigned anyone to be an admin officer. But, but it, it, in conceptually, yes, that's, that's possible, that if you had a group of 20 detectives and they had two or three people in admin support and that was reduced by one, then clearly, you know, that could happen. But we're trying to minimise that across the state. Statistics. Mm -hmm. Is there something in there that personally? Um, look, look. I don't think there is one thing that that uh, absolutely uh, jumps out. Um, and um, uh, I, I um, obviously just want us to keep focused uh, as an organisation on our on our overall goal. Um, and um, for the 31 districts throughout the state, obviously as part of our processes. Uh, that's the operational performance review process that the Minister was talking about. Uh, for each of those, um, they will, um, and we will, with them, uh, look at their results. Um, and um, we give you an undertaking that, you know, that um, we, we just think that what we should do is focus on what the public want. Um, and we think that that is their safety, number one, and there are many dimensions to that. And that includes the road toll. I mean, actually, the, the reality is that, the, you know, the, the place where we're most likely to get hurt is on the roads. Um, uh, so everything to do with their safety is number one. We think that the second most important thing to them is um, their property in terms of their homes, their businesses not being broken into and their cars not being stolen. Uh, and then we think, thirdly, uh, the most important thing to them is that uh, they can be at a public event or public space and be safe. So whether that's a state of origin football match, um, whatever it is, you know, whether it's going to the mall in the city here to go shopping in a movie and have lunch, that, that they're safe, you know, in, in all of those things as well. Um, so they're our priorities and, um, and uh, we'll remain focused on them. Domestic violence is an area that is disappointing and like, I know it's an issue that's very hard to tackle. Do we need more resources? Do we need more education? How do you tackle what is largely a hidden problem? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it, look, it, that's a, a really um, difficult one in this sense because um, the rates, I think, of um, breaches of domestic violence are up by 4%. Now, that could be a good thing. Uh, that's part of the difficulty with this. Not, not, I think that's why it's important to have these discussions about figures because it, sometimes the, the reality goes beyond what you see up front. It could be a good thing. It might mean that more women are empowered, and generally it is women, uh, to report breaches of domestic violence because they have faith in the system. They think something will be done about it and there will be some effect of it. But, but overall, clearly, uh, there needs more work to be done. Uh, we need more education. We need more awareness. Most, most perpetrators of domestic violence are men, not always, but by far most are. 
Uh, and in some cases, that's men who've grown up as a child in a family where there's been domestic violence and they're repeating the behaviour of their father. Uh, so education campaigns, awareness campaigns, programs for these men uh, that they can hopefully change their behaviour, their outlook and their attitude to women, they're really important. And a huge amount's been done in that space in, in the last, you know, um, 10 years or so. What we've done in the police department is try and ensure, and I believe we have achieved this, that police see domestic violence as really important police work, that it is something that's part of when traffic, investigating serious crime, that it's an important part of police work. And for what it's worth, uh, it's my humble view that that reduction in homicide over the last 30 years is no accident. Uh, and that the reason is because of our increased awareness of domestic violence. Because the reality is that most, most not all, of course, the, there's gangland killings and there's all sorts of things, but most um, murders occur out of domestic violence situations. So if we can do more in terms of where the warning signs are there, and one of the classic warning signs is a violent domestic where the male grabs the female, the woman, around the throat. Uh, that's a real early warning indicator of potential future homicide. Uh, so if we can do more in that space of awareness, uh, treatment, education, all of those things, um, you know, we, we can improve the situation we're in now. One of the biggest things, I think, though, is empowering women in difficult circumstances to actually do something about it. And that can be because of their family circumstances or if they live in a small country town or somewhere, they'd be embarrassed, you know. Um, so there's a whole lot of extra work that can be done. I also notice the victims for offences against a person are most likely to be between 15 and 19. Um, the women in that age bracket, what's that? I think that's pretty traditional, regrettably. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I, I think th this is a useful document in terms of looking at all this sort of stuff. In fact, as self serving as it sounds, it's probably the best of any police department in Australia. Um, and, and, but that has for a long time been that. Um, people at the greatest risk are in that, that bracket and um, and I don't think that's changed over time. Is it going out or them, is that more assault related or what? I think it's across the board, yeah. Well certainly they're out and about, yeah, and that's part of it. Um, they're probably uh, males particularly in that age group take risks, uh, higher risks. Uh, their judgment is not matured. Um, so yeah, there's a range of factors in there. But it, it is pretty traditional that that group um, is your, your greatest at risk group, and that tends the next group probably greatest at risk is men up to about the age of 25. And I guess both of them probably um, both of those females as well, because females are even higher than males in yeah. that category. So again, the women are vulnerable, maybe drinking, start drinking at that age, that sort of thing. Is that kind of do you think? Th there's a range of um, situations there, and clearly, sadly, some of those um, girls. Uh, victims of sexual abuse in family situations as well, you know, by people who are known to them. Um, for any situation, um, um, alcohol, uh, for any of us, any of us, it doesn't matter what age you are, um, you know, the sensible, safe consumption of alcohol and safe practices in that space are really, really important. Uh, so that's the broad message to everyone in the community. You know, if you're going to have a drink, um, uh, you know, pre-plan how you're going to get home, uh, have someone in your group perhaps who's not going to have a drink, those sorts of things. They're messages we really push at schoolies um, and we think that that's been helpful um, in, in, and I know schoolies isn't over yet for a few more days, um, but we think that arguably this schoolies um, was probably um, one of the best ever, if not the best ever. Uh, and um, one of the things that happened in that space that we think has helped is, is going around to the schools before schoolies and trying to get these messages across, you know, about uh, look after your mates, be sensible, have a plan, those sorts of messages. Uh, um, well, no, um, uh, not at the moment. Uh, did you, do you, can you be more specific? Or? No, it's not finalised yet. Yes, there is an internal disciplinary process um, with Senior Constable Wheeler uh, that is ongoing and is not finalised as yet. Now, were there any other questions? Uh, all right. Well, thank you again for your... Uh, uh, and can I again make the offer, you know, in, in terms of any follow-up questions uh, or any future uh, press conferences, I'm uh, happy to engage in those. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.